Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Mastermind Minutes. My name is Gary Occhibroso. I am the founder and managing partner of Franchise Growth Solutions. And Mastermind Minutes, for those of you who are tuning in for the very first time, is a very simple webcast podcast that doesn't take hours. We do it in minutes. It's typically one question, one guest, and one topic that we talk about for 20 minutes or so. And uh, while we realize that might be a bit of a tease, uh, we will always give you the contact information of our guest so that if you feel um, like you'd like to reach out to the guest directly, you can feel free to do that. And today, uh, my guest is David Whalen, and he is the founder and CEO of HOTS, which is an emerging concept in the fast casual franchise space. Uh, he is a born and raised Binghamton, I'm not sure if it's a Binghamtonite. Binghamtonian. Or, we'll uh, go with Binghamtonian. Binghamtonian. A Binghamtonian, wow. Uh, he's also a graduate of, of Binghamton University with a BA in management. And uh, when he got out of school, and he'll tell you about this, he kind of bounced around in corporate America for a while, did a little of this, a little of that. Uh, never really satisfied him. And that, by the way, is a very common occurrence in people who are entrepreneurs. And David says that He's all, always, always had entrepreneurial ambitions, which led him to um, create the HOTS concept in 2010. And that also coincided with the downtown uh, Binghamton student-driven revitalization. Um, so David, before we get into the question, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, about HOTS, your vision for it, your goals, just talk to us. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, uh, born and raised in Binghamton, in Binghamton, I'm a proud Binghamtonian. Um, uh, graduated from Binghamton University in 2005 uh, with a degree in management. Um, so I've always been interested in, in business. I always had that entrepreneurial uh, drive and ambition. I had no idea um, how that would manifest itself. Uh, so upon graduating, I had a couple of jobs in the corporate world. I did uh, radio ad sales directly out of college. Um, there were some things I enjoyed about that, um, not the least of which was going out and, and being able to meet new people, um, talk to business owners, um, discuss some of the things that were going on in their businesses and, and how the community impacted those. Um, but again, nothing that really fulfilled that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, from there, I went to a, a project management position. Um, you know, again, some positive things that I enjoyed about that job, um, a good learning experience. Uh, but I always knew in the back of my mind and in my heart that I wanted to work for myself. Um, and to give you a little background on, on the city of Binghamton, uh, we're very much a, a part of the Rust Belt. I know when people think Rust Belt, they think the Midwest, um, but Binghamton was, was a fairly big city in the Northeast um, in the early 1900s and all the way through the, the 60s, really. Um, IBM was founded here in Binghamton, which many people don't know. Um, EJ Shoe Factory, which was one of the biggest um, shoe manufacturers in the world around the turn of the, uh, the century. Um, was in Endicott, which is located just down the road. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, people would get off the boat at Ellis Island, immigrants, and, and the one sentence they knew in English that they were taught on the way here was, which way EJ? Um, so Binghamton was a, was a pretty happening place, uh, believe it or not, you know, a half a century or so ago, unfortunately, as, as that uh, industry dried up and IBM pulled out, we were left with, with nothing here um, in the way of uh, an economic driver. Uh, Binghamton University at that time was fairly small, um, but they made a commitment to the community and the, and the state made a commitment to them to allow them to grow. And they soon became, you know, the biggest uh, economic driver in the community, the biggest employer, um, and certainly, uh, you know, one of the only, uh, you know, stakeholders in this community in, in terms of, um, you know, an economic driver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as that unfolded, the city of Binghamton, uh, downtown specifically, um, was kind of just a dreary, uh, you know, boarded up place. There were a couple of bars on State Street we would visit on the weekends when we were in college, and then we would, uh, you know, hop in a cab and, and go down the parkway to Denny's and then go back to uh, the university. Um, so one of the things the city of Binghamton, you know, worked very hard on with the university was getting them to put, to, and to give you a little background, the university is about three miles away from downtown Binghamton. Um, so it's a little decentralized. So the city of Binghamton wanted the university to have some kind of brick and mortar operation in downtown Binghamton, uh, which finally came to fruition, 
in about 2008, 2009. They put a downtown center in that was a combination of classrooms, laboratories, dormitories. And, it, you know, that really got people excited and spurred a lot of private investment. Um, immediately thereafter, a couple of student housing projects popped up and, and they were fairly decent size, several hundred uh, beds each. Um, and at that point, I think everyone knew that downtown was on the cusp of revitalization, what exactly it would look like. You know, people were uncertain, but we knew it would be uh, university and student driven. Um, at that point, you know, I was living here locally. I was working in that project man management position. Um, and I, I saw uh, quite immediately the opportunity that would be there in terms of serving uh, that clientele that was moving into the downtown area, uh, both to uh, to go to school, um, to work, to visit, but also to live at this point. Um, being not far removed from college, uh, what do college students always want? What was our biggest complaint when we were down there on the weekends? Um, food. There was nothing to eat. Uh, certainly nothing decent, certainly nothing in the hours, um, you know, that we wanted it. Uh, you know, we were out uh, socializing or, or stopping at the bars for a drink or two. Um, so that was kind of the impetus and the thought process behind HOTS um, in terms of, of what our vision for the model was itself. Um, as you mentioned, a fast casual uh, concept that would cater to the needs of the students uh, working, living, uh, going to school downtown. Um, and not just them, but also, uh, you know, the ancillary folks that would be coming into the downtown area with everything else that was now going on. Um, so business people, folks visiting uh, for a show at the Forum or the arena. Um, so that was, you know, a uh, 50,000 foot view, what we wanted HOTS to be. And, and from there we said, well, what do, you know, what do these folks want to eat? What can we serve them in the fashion that we want to, to get them in and out and create the atmosphere we're looking to do? And, and we kind of came up with, um, you know, what we refer to as an upstate New York burger concept. Um, so a pretty well-rounded uh, burger concept with some upstate New York staples like the garbage plate from the Rochester area. Um, the Speedy, which is uh, native to the Binghamton area, uh, which is a pretty unique dish as well. Um, so we kind of, you know, carved out the menu that way and, and, and worked backward from there um, to serve that clientele. Yeah. And, and I hear you about the, uh, the unique menu items being a downstater. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I really didn't know what a garbage plate was until okay. I visited your establishment uh, up in Binghamton and, and, and really said, wow, you know, this, yeah, this is kind of the thing that you'd want it. Like maybe one in the morning after being out. Absolutely. You know, because you'd be surprised how many business people will come in and have one at noon. Well, that that I don't know about. I think if I had one of those at noon, I would probably fall asleep uh, in my, <laughs> my desk. They very well may do that. Close the door and, and take a nap. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So, you know, look, we can go to the question, but I want to kind of pre-frame it here because you, you touched on a few things that I think are interesting and kind of tie in together. Um, you know, occasionally we have, well, more than occasionally, we have uh, tied our topic into the current situation with COVID and the pandemic and try not to do it every time, but, uh, you know, it becomes unavoidable at times. I think in, in the case of, of our discussion with you, it's, it's unavoidable for two reasons. One, you're in the restaurant business and the restaurant business, um, you know, has been hammered. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with a lack of guidance from leadership. Absolutely. Um, and I almost, I reluctantly use the word leadership. Um, and the other piece I think that's maybe unique to you and, and other food establishments in, in, in university towns is that colleges, universities, schools, they've been impacted. Um, you know, they send the kids home or you, you can't come back after Thanksgiving or whatever it is which means that your customer base is not in town. Uh, they may be in school, but unless you can serve food, you know, via Zoom, um, you know, they're not around. So that, that's kind of a unique set of challenges. And, and I'd like to hear how you maybe have addressed this and, and perhaps adapted since, you know, going back to the earlier days of the pandemic in March and April and kind of how this has evolved to a point where you're able to survive and thrive as it relates to COVID and college campuses. Absolutely, so I mean, going all the way back to March, um, you know, obviously when the, when the news of the pandemic first broke, everyone was kind of uncertain, A, how serious it would be, uh, B, how long it would last and, and C, what kind of impact it would have, um, you know, in this community with the university. Um, 
shortly thereafter, we learned that Binghamton University um, was going to go to online class only. Um, so, we, you know, I guess to back that up a little bit, one of the things I like about operating a business in a, in a college community is very predictable business cycles. Um, you can look at the academic calendar and you can kind of pinpoint what your year is going to look like. And while the downside is that there are big swings in business throughout the year, um, knowing exactly when they're going to occur certainly helps to mitigate that and we can plan accordingly. Um, that went out the window about the second week of March last year. Um, so the university immediately went to online classes. That lasted for a couple of weeks. Uh, cases continued to rise and finally they um, shut the doors, sent everyone home and finished the semester completely online. Um, that the, the effect that this had, uh, or that had rather on this community was uh, tremendous. I mean, you look at the university in, in terms of its uh, economic input, in, in terms of dollars and cents, they directly, um, inject about $700 million into this community per year. Um, and, and by the time that trickles down through the economy, it's, a, it's about double in total economic input. So um, some people were very nervous at that time. We immediately, um, in accordance with New York State regulations, switched to a takeout and delivery only model, um, cut our hours way back. So we were basically operating uh, through lunch and dinner and, and shutting down everything else uh, prior to that. The late night business was a big part of what we did with the college students. Um, you know, going through the summer, things started to stabilize a little bit. Um, they weren't wonderful, but uh, we were allowed to have some indoor dining again starting the second week of June. Um, the weather was nice. Cases were down a little bit. People were out wandering around. So while the students were mostly gone for the summer, there was some local activity here. Um, and at that point, you know, everybody's big question was, will the students be back in the fall? Uh, you know, if they are back, what will that look like? As you mentioned, in terms of, of in-person class versus uh, strictly online classes, um, how many students off campus are going to come back versus staying at home and, and learning online. Um, so the, the biggest um, hurdle at that point was just simply the uncertainty and what was going to happen. I think the pleasant surprise in the you know, mid, mid to late August was it seemed that most of the students did return. The university was committed to bringing students back to campus and having in-person class. It was, it was a hybrid model, really, some combination of in-person, online. Um, but the bottom line was the students were here. Um, we had, at that point, adapted very well to a, a delivery and takeout heavy model. Um, and that's also a model that students, uh, being very um, comfortable with technology, were very, very uh, adept with. Um, so I, I think in our particular um, business model at, at Binghamton Hots, uh, it served us quite well. And it has up until this point. Now, um, that being said, uh, tomorrow is the last day of in-person class uh, for the semester. Um, the semester was truncated and they went straight through from uh, the last week of August until tomorrow uh, without any breaks, obviously to stop people from coming and going and potentially spreading uh, COVID. And um, now the uncertainty begins again as students don't return for spring semester until February 13th. So we're talking an almost you know three month gap there um, with no students here in town. So we're, we're getting ready to enter the unknown again. Um, it's, it's been, a roller coaster ride. It's been certainly an interesting eight months, and uh, we're we're not quite done yet. Um, but the university is is committed to keeping the students here at, to whatever extent possible. I think they're in a bit of a precarious position, as many universities are across the country. They're they're bringing these students back, um, you know, not just uh, altruistically so they can get the best learning experience, but there's a lot of dollars and cents at stake as well. And I I think if the universities overplay their hand, it could change the landscape of higher education going forward, um, you know, in the near and long term, but that's a different conversation. Well, I, I, and look, it sounds like the same type of challenges that a lot of my clients here in New York City have had. Um, of course, you know, the news is always focused on New York City, and a lot of folks tend to lose sight of the fact that what was going on downstate well, maybe not to the same extent, upstate, it was still going on. And given smaller populations, the impact was probably the same, if not more. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you did, if anything, by the way, because it could be, the answer could be nothing. Um, did you revamp your menu at all? Did, were you, did you kind of get rid of or stop selling things that were, you know, things that didn't really sell all that well? And, maybe do the best of hots. What was, what was that like? 
we did call the menu a little bit, especially uh, in the beginning for a couple of reasons, not the least of which was um, our purveyors. Uh, the, the pricing from our purveyors was just all over the map. Um, and I know beef specifically is the first one comes to mind uh, was about quadruple what we had been paying um, prior uh, to the COVID shutdowns. Um, so there were some menu items that, that weren't economically feasible uh, for us to continue selling. Our margins basically evaporated overnight. Um, that being said, we, we also uh, you know cut some items that didn't necessarily deliver or take out well. Uh, we changed up our packaging a little bit um, to make sure that food you know held well while it was being transported, that it you know arrived to the customer in the best possible quality. Um, so we we did quite a bit of that. Um, the difficult part you know for us was deciding uh, you know which items were most important to the customers, um, you know which kind of customer base we wanted to focus on with the with the revamp menu. Um, and, you know, it was a learning process, but, uh, but we got through it and, and a lot of those changes we kept in place at the start of the fall semester because they ended up serving us well. Good. good. That's good to hear. And yeah, I mean, we, we have a division in our company that does rec uh, restaurant assessments and recommendations and um, Fred, who, you know, who I, who I work with, he and I were very busy helping, uh, not, not so much chain restaurants, but kind of the mom and pop operators in not only understanding how to revamp their menu for cost of goods and efficiencies, uh, but also how to, you know, how to utilize third party ordering platforms and some of these things that m many of them just simply did not care to use up to this point, uh, but then found themselves forced to use it. By the way, they now like it uh, because it is increased business. And we understand there's increased costs, but there's, there's increased business. Okay, why don't we, just to kind of round this out, um, tell us about the franchise. Uh, you and I work on the franchise together. Um, talk to me about how HOTS became, in your mind, a vehicle that you felt you would want to franchise, uh, as well as you know where you'd like to franchise in the immediate future, how many units in the next couple of years is your goal, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with your uh, with your contact information. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the the idea behind franchising the concept was really, you know, looking at it on its face, um, it does very well here in Binghamton, New York. I think it is a good fit for similar communities, of which there are many in, in New York State uh, in the Northeast in general. Um, it, it is a college centric concept, and that's not to say that it, it couldn't work in a in a big metro area like New York. Um, but we feel the concept just makes sense. Um, the, the menu has appeal. Um, the logistics that we've worked out and the systems we put in place um, would certainly give an advantage to any owner operator that wanted to come into the system. Um, I'm glad I was uh, hooked up with you um, at Harold's recommendation um, to work together on the franchise de development. And really, we hope this year um, to bring two franchises into the system. Uh, COVID has certainly um, put a damper on that situation. And, and ironically, I feel at the beginning of this, we had some really good substantive conversations with folks. Uh, and I think the difference at that time was that people thought this would be over within a matter of weeks, if, if not months, and there would be tremendous opportunity on the backside of it. And that just yeah. uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't come to fruition yet. It will at some point, but it's kind of anybody's guess when. Um, so, you know, I feel those conversations have dried up a little bit at this point, um, but I, I still feel there's tremendous opportunity on the other side of this pandemic and this concept makes sense uh, for many communities in the New York State area and the Northeast in general. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we're at right now. We're working on the lead generation and the, uh, the development side and, and trying to bring some franchises into the system. Yeah, and I, and I agree. First of all, this is not forever. Uh, and uh, I also believe that we are when we come out on the back end, you know, there are, there are lots of opportunities right now in the restaurant business. And a lot of folks, you know, when I say that, they scratch their heads. And, and I tell them, hey, you know what? If you were to start a restaurant today, if you would start the process of opening up a restaurant today, chances are that restaurant wouldn't be open for four, five, six, seven months, okay? Once you, because you've got to go through site selection process, building it out, everything. Sure. Well, you can't, you, you know, where are we going to be in five or six months? We're going to be further down the pipeline. I think it's going to be very positive. There's lots of positive news. Uh, so from a franchising point of view, the folks who are actually of that mindset are very active knowing that there's 
second generation restaurant space. The cost of money is pretty cheap, right? Well, not pretty cheap. It's cheaper than probably what my grandparents ever saw when they were kids. Um, it's really, you know, it's, it's really cheap. The, the other thing that I think that's interesting, and I'll kind of leave it, leave it here, and then you can give us your contact information. I don't want to run over time here, is that the, the, one of the other unique aspects about HOTS, and we're referring to it as HOTS, but your location is Binghamton HOTS. Correct. And if I were to open up one, say, in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, you know, the University of Fairfield, my HOTS would be Fairfield HOTS, correct? Absolutely. Or Absolutely. Syracuse HOTS, Rutgers, well, I guess that's New Brunswick HOTS. So you're creating a sense of place that's uniquely tied to the university in that town, correct? Without a doubt. And I think that's one of the uh, things that most appeals to me about being in a college town, a, a, a direct sense of community um, a tied to your guests and clientele. Um, and it's, it's very easy to connect with them in that fashion. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. All right, David, anyone wants to get in touch with you either about um, the challenges you faced or maybe some advice if they're facing the same challenges or if they're interested in contacting you about uh, perhaps learning more about the franchise, what do they do? do Absolutely, BinghamtonHots.com. Uh, you can enter a, a message on their website and it'll be sent directly to our email. Feel free to email me directly at David Whalen 8 at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn and uh, Binghamton Hots is active on Facebook and Instagram as well. Great. Thank you. And for those of you who didn't write all of that down, that's okay. Uh, you know, when we post this on YouTube, LinkedIn, and when it hits Spotify, Apple, um, there is, um, there's text there. So we will, all of that information will be posted. David, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in person at some point in the near future. Uh, best success. And, uh, we, uh, we will see everyone the next time uh, on Mastermind Minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate it. My pleasure, pal. Be well.